All right, so what can we do? What's the key to teaching causal inference effectively? I mean, you have to do it regularly to a university audience. So maybe, you know, how can we teach causal inference effectively to a university audience? But what can I be doing to try to convey these issues just in informal conversations with family members and that kind of thing? Um, and in particular, so, so far we've just been talking about it from the personal experience level, but there's also this issue of people conflating correlation with causation. And I think that that happens, the, correla the correlation causation conflation <laughs> happens even to very well-educated people, even to people who are formally trained and should know better, I think. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, it's a very natural impulse, again, I think based on human psychology. It doesn't help that when, you know, popular press, you know, newspaper articles, all kinds of other media pick up scientific literature that might have been well written to begin with, they're going right. to jump, you know, the, the, the chance of that headline having a, a causal implication in it is, is much higher because it's sexier, right. it's more interesting, right? That's how people think. So tomatoes that's part cause of the cancer. Tomatoes don't cause cancer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Wine's good for you then it's bad for you. Then it's good for you yeah. again, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, nutritional epi is the worst. Uh, it's really hard to do that kind of work. Yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> well, so, I've had, so, so I've had that exact experience with family members where they're like, yes, I yes. don't even listen to these anymore because I keep hearing on the news that, yeah, blueberries are good for me. Blueberries are bad for me. Red wine, that's a big one. It seems to come up all the time. Red wine is good for you. Red wine is bad for you. And it's like, so people are like, you know, there's, it, it has caused some people to believe that somehow there is no real underlying truth. <laughs> right. That because, it, because they're hearing a change on the news all the time, they're like, there can't be some real truth here. And it's really unfortunate. Anyway, I've kind of gone off on tangent here. Because no, no, it's true. I, my, I have family members who really don't like having these conversations with me <laughs> because I'm not fun. Um, on the other hand, my whole family now says, but what is the counterfactual? <laughs> so <laughs> there's, there's that that happens too. And, you know, what's good when you're feeling judgy about other people is to start noticing your own behavior. So when you read the article that says... I don't know, some think of a food you don't like and that that's bad for you. You're like, I always knew it, right? <laughs> when it conforms right. with your priors. Yeah, but when bias. you read the thing that says, you know, um, like salt, I love salt. So I've mm -hmm. dug into the literature on salt <laughs> deep because <laughs> I really yeah. want to believe it's not that bad for you. It's really not that bad yeah. for most people, most people. Right, right, right. Um, so I'm, I'm really uh, glad to hear that. I'm going to add it into my confirmation, confirmation bias database because I also love salt. And I'm actually frequently telling people that I haven't done as much research as you probably, but I also am pretty sure that, yes, for most people, for healthy people, it is okay to have salt. Like, especially if you have, like, I have low blood pressure, I can be eating salt. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, 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 it's true. So, um, so then I would challenge you to think of the next time that you have the confirmation bias side of things. And like, are you going to look up that article and make sure that the study <laughs> was really well done and rigorous <laughs> or do you right. just take it? Right. We also all have limited time, but um, so how do you teach it? Uh, um, yeah, I've been teaching it for a <laughs> long, long time and I think I've slowly gotten better um, really, it's about it's much more about a mindset um, than about any particular tool. So students come in thinking I'm going to teach them the magic that's going to make them that allow them to suddenly do causal inference. And more, what it is is that I teach them that it's really hard, and they have to think hard about assumptions, and they have to know their subject matter area well. They have to talk to the experts. They have to talk to the people on the ground. Um, and they have to communicate super clearly. So I'm a big fan of don't say, oh, I'm not even trying to do something causal. I'm just doing something descriptive and I'm going to use the word association to make that clear. And then in my discussion section, make big recommendations about what people should do. <laughs> right? Right. So I'd rather say I'm trying to do, I really want to do something causal. This is the precise causal question, but these are the assumptions that need to be satisfied. And you, the reader, can decide 
you know, once I've been very transparent and clear about it, whether or not you believe those assumptions, and then you, you know, you leave it up to the reader to, to understand. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that almost everyone in both academic studies, as well as just general inferences you're making in life, you almost never care that two variables are just correlated. You really want to know the causal direction and you really, your, your brain for whatever reason, probably because it was useful evolutionarily to be trying sure. to infer causality. Sure. And we, yeah. are, we see a correlation and you're like, well, that in, even if, even if I am really good and I write in the paper, all the caveats, like you're saying, still in my mind, I'm like, I think I know the causal direction here. I think I know what's going on. I feel like I understand this process. Of um, course. It's very natural. Sounds good. I feel like you're my therapist there. You're like, so, so, so I've, <laughs> I actually, um, yeah, you know, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It's how you communicate it to others. Um, I, we just actually, I've, over the past year, have done a bunch of studies with college students where we present to them research findings and we experimentally manipulate how we phrase things. Do we use the word association, but then a word like increase tied with it? Or do we say very clearly, no, we're just comparing two groups? Or do we use the word causal? And mm -hmm. to see whether how much that wording actually makes a difference in whether or not students uh, infer causality about the relationship between the variables. And so two things. One is, yes, it makes a difference. Um, but what makes a bigger difference is how much they believed it to begin with. <laughs> right? Yeah. So if, if someone already thinks they know a lot about the relationship between vaping and anxiety in, you know, high school students, they, they're very quick to go to causal, even if we've, it doesn't matter how we've changed the wording, right? So yeah. um, anyway, very uh, Vaping is bad, sobering. phones are bad, video games are bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't care how you write it. Yeah, so that's, so the language that we use can make a difference in situations where people don't already have a strongly preformed opinion on how they think that that piece of the universe works. Yeah. 